How do these normally start? Like, how do you guys do these? Yeah, yeah, go back to the beginning. What was, it, uh, what was your childhood like? I grew up in Florida, um, and a small town outside of Jacksonville. And um, we kind of grew up in like a retirement community. <laughs> so it wasn't a lot of kids. It was mostly just my brother and myself. So we, <laughs> we did play a lot of video games during that time. Mostly PC games growing up. Like DOS or like? Yeah, I had a Tandy 1000. Um, which is like an early 486 computer. And so we, we played a lot of adventure games, uh, like Sierra games, and, and then once LucasArts started releasing games, we, we owned all of those, because was, that was our favorite, for sure. For the longest time, I thought I wanted to be a programmer, until I realized how, how much math you need to know to do that. And um, I'm pretty good at math, but like, uh, there was just really complicated stuff that I was like, I don't know if this is really for me. <laughs> But I still pursued it for quite a bit. I really got into the um, into mood, uh, modding Doom, um, so I, I made tons of uh, levels for Doom, and um, that's when I first started understanding how games were kind of put together, which is which is pretty exciting. You kind of look behind the curtain and see like how all these things are constructed and how all the different files work, and it was pretty it's pretty neat. And there was such a huge community around that. There's a lot of tools and lots of resources. Yeah, who were you sharing that stuff with? Yeah, there was like a community at, in Jacksonville of people who were playing competitively for Doom and Doom 2. I never met them in person. Yeah, it's all it's just people I met through the bulletin boards. This is back when there was not really a formal internet. It was like uh, dial-up BBSs and stuff. Yeah, because everybody was dialing into one guy's house, basically. <laughs> Which actually went to that guy's house eventually, and it was a trailer in the middle of like this really bad part of Jacksonville. Um, and I actually bought my first CD burner from that guy, like a one-speed like scuzzy CD burner, which was pretty pretty awesome back in the day. So when you're going through school, like you thought you wanted to be a programmer, but like what what were the other options? Like what was sort of taking you through high school? And mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I started getting interested in 3D art a lot. Um, didn't really know where to begin because some of that stuff is pretty intimidating without taking any kind of formal classes. I think it's gotten a lot easier now because you have like YouTube and you know there's lots of books and stuff like that. But back then there wasn't a lot of that, and even some of these early uh, 3D software packages were pretty intimidating. So it wasn't really until I got into like my first year of college that I took my first 3D class that I was like, oh, this is super cool, and I could, you know, the teacher was really good at explaining how things worked. And then I was like, I I would like to do this as a career at some point <laughs> if I can. What school did you go to? Savannah College of Art and Design. And this is back when they were like just starting to do uh, you know, a game program. It was literally like a year old, the program uh, for doing game art. I think it was computer art, I think was what they called it first. It's, it's huge now, like they're, they have one of the best programs now, but back then it was pretty rinky dink. Like I think most people who went to school there, they learned from the people around them. You know, like my, I learned almost everything from my roommate, Hi Fen who's an amazing artist. He actually is one of the lead character artists at Blizzard right now. And so just, and this guy is super dedicated. So it was an inspiration to see every day, like he would work all night, every day on work, uh, 3D modeling. And he's, a, he's also a really good 2D artist. And so just, he pushed me really hard to like, you know, really dedicate my time to, to learning Maya and to learn, um, you know, how to model and how to draw and all of those, those things that really helped me. It was interesting because all my I had three roommates and they all represented like a different, completely different discipline. One was an architecture major, one was 3D art, which is high, and then another was a sequential art, which is like comic books. Comic books and architecture are two things I never really even considered before, but getting that perspective allowed me to like look at things a lot differently. Actually, getting into comic books was a good too. It was a good exposure to um, independent comic scene, which I'm a huge fan of, and yeah, I think that stuff is really cool. And a lot, I think a lot of the stuff we had to do at Double Find is, is actually inspired by a lot of those really cool independent comics. Um, so that was a really cool inspiration. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people were trying to get into movies at the time, actually, because games weren't, like the path to get into games was pretty unclear. And I think a lot of people were excited about going to work for ILM or to work for, uh, you know, Rhythm Hughes or whatever, or Blue Sky, all these big um, post-production studios. I wasn't as interested in that stuff. I was much more interested in, um, in getting to games somehow. How did you think you'd actually break into the industry after you finished? I didn't know, actually. 
I mean, I finished the sc I finished school and I graduated, and it was kind of like now what? I don't. I actually didn't even know what I was going to do with the degree. Um, I think I had a pretty good portfolio, and I did some art tests for uh, for EA, and they were interested in um, talking to me further about working at on the Madden team, but I'm not into football, so and I actually kind of wanted to get out of Florida, anyways. So I, I just I didn't think that that was going to be a good path. Little I know that like that was probably going to be one of the only opportunities that I was going to have to just jump right into a game studio working on 3D art, but not realizing how competitive it is in California to get a job as a 3D artist. Uh, but I just I decided just to like jump in my car and just drive out here anyways. <laughs> I had I had a job lined up um, to work uh, at a studio, but. Uh, you know, when I got about halfway, I found out from the recruiter that the project had been canceled and the job was no longer available, which is tough because I was already halfway. And I think I was at, at, you know, in Texas when I found out that like there was no job for me there. I didn't have any money really, but I was like, you know what? I think I had, I had a friend who lived there, and I, I figured, you know, I could just stay with him and find find a job. Yeah, I kind of blindly went out there, which is probably not a good idea. Don't go to don't go to LA without a job because <laughs> it's kind of could turn out really bad. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you have any work experience before going out there? Did you even just do like little jobs? Like yeah, I mean, I had, I had plenty of jobs. I worked as a um, sys administrator um, in high school, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is bizarre. I don't know how that, I was at a hospital. Mm -hmm. And that was a really, a really cool, cool experience, actually. I'm surprised they let me do that. I was just a kid. <laughs> yeah, most of my jobs were all computer jobs. I was a computer tech. I would like drive out to people's houses and fix their computers and stuff, which is interesting. It's also terrifying sometimes when you you can run into some weirdos sometimes. There were other reasons why you decided to change your path, right? Yeah. So I was at um, just finishing up the, the like summer before you go off to college, and I was talking to my brother, and he was like, you know, what are you gonna do? Like, where are you gonna go to college? And I was like, well, I'm gonna go to Florida State, and I'm gonna study computer programming. And he's like, yeah, that's cool, I guess. He's like, I don't know, I mean, for what? And I was like, I don't know, like, whatever programmers do in Florida, <laughs> I guess. And he's like, I don't know, man, it seems like you should, you could do more than that. You could have, you love these games so much, you know, you grew up playing these adventure games. Like, why don't you go make those? And I was like, I don't even know if they make those anymore, honestly. And he's like, I, I bet they do. He's like, you should go find out what that Tim Schafer guy is doing. I know how much you like his games. And uh, at the time, I was like, okay, whatever. I'll never be able to do that. Like, we bonded over a lot of those games. Some of my fondest memories growing up were playing those games with my brother. Um, playing games like Maniac Mansion and uh, Monkey Island, uh, Day of the Tentacle, all those games. Like, they're all, I mean, I can think so vividly of how those experiences were playing it with him um, on our crappy little computer. And, you know, and a lot of times he would play, and I would just be like looking over his shoulder and kind of telling him what to do and that sort of thing. But you know, he's the older brother, and yeah, <laughs> that sort of thing. How much older was he? He was one year older than I am. Okay. Yeah. So I was excited about going to college with him because he was already at Florida State. Mm -hmm. um, you know, have him show me the ropes and that sort of thing. So um, when we were driving out to Florida State on our drive out there for the first day of college, um, it was raining really, really hard, and uh, he had a he had a car accident, and uh, he died. And I was right behind him, so yeah, it was tough. Um, so you're driving out together. Yeah, exactly, for our first day. But um, yeah, I, I didn't really know um, what to do mm -hmm. because I had it was one of those things you never suspect would ever happen to you. But um, yeah, it changed my life. Was it difficult to stay? at Florida State for that reason? Was it just like a reminder of that? You know, it was because, um, you know, a lot of his friends were there and they were all trying to make me feel welcome. They, they, were, they were really nice. Um, but it was just a huge reminder of him and uh, his, his legacy, you know, and it, I felt like I was living in his shadow a little bit when I was there. Um, he had already been there for a year. Right, exactly. So he had built this, this group, huge group of friends you know, and I was like, it was still, I was so numb about the whole thing, but I'm still trying to like go to school and like get a, you know, move forward with my life, which is super hard under those conditions. Um, 
there wasn't there was a certain point where I was like, you know what, maybe I should maybe I should just try what he told me to do. Maybe I should go try to make games, I guess. You know, my parents were actually really supportive. It's they were confused, right? They they were just like, we don't know anything. Like you said, programmer that seems like a pretty stable thing, but like video games that seems so. Um, it just seems like one of those impossible goals in some ways. But they had absolute faith that I was going to figure it out because I'm I'm a pretty like tenacious person in general. I felt like I could do it. By the end of it, I was like, you know what? I feel like I have the skills to do this. It wasn't until I got to California that I realized like there's a lot of people who want to do that. There's a lot of people who are really, really skilled in California that they all came out with the same dream of like, I want to take, I take all these skills I learned in school and I want to go get a job working at, you know, big game studios, making big games. And it just doesn't work like that, unfortunately, for most people. And no one ever told me like, how do you even get into these places? Because they all say the same thing. Unless you have the most kick-ass portfolio, like you're not going to get in, unfortunately. Um, and there's no like, mail room or anything like that. Um, so I started in QA. And that's the one thing I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are trying to get into the industry, you know, students that are trying to get in, whatever. You should never think that QA is below you. I learned so much by going through that, just about like how games are constructed and um, how the teams make, or the teams are made up and like how schedules work. And it's, it really gave me uh, insight that, this, that school never did because you know, school in a lot of ways is very academic in its perception of how games are made. And it's, it's not about the nuts and bolts. Actually, a lot of the teachers, I'm sure, I mean, I know some of the teachers that I worked with, they couldn't cut it in the real industry. So they went to go be a teacher. And so you're not going to get a very realistic perspective on how games are really made um, because they just don't know. It's not until you actually dive in and, and get some kind of job. And QA is a good lead into that. And I, the secret of QA, I felt for me, was like, just take it seriously. It's a job, and you know everybody around you is going to be having fun and and you know it's playing games. But like, if you are the one person that really, really takes it seriously, you'll stand out for sure. What studio did you start off with for QA? Yeah, I started um, at 2K, um, which is in the San Fernando Valley. It's, they have a QA studio out there, and they're they're basically the only places hiring and. I was like, sure. yeah, why not? I guess so. So I worked on some pretty interesting kind of budget games, <laughs> like Ford versus Chevy and wrestling racing and like uh, close combat first to fight was like, was the first game that I worked on that shipped. It's Global Star, which is like their like budget label. I did that for like seven months, and then I got a call from that recruiter. She said, you know, why don't you come work at EA? And I thought, oh, okay, sure as an artist? And she's like, no, it's not as an artist, it's in QA again. And I was like, honestly, th that sounds great. Because the problem we're working at 2K is that there weren't, that studio specifically was not a developer, it was purely a publisher. Actually, this is when I started realizing, like, there's a big difference between a publisher and a developer. And I need, definitely wanted to be in a situation where I'm surrounded by people developing video games. And going to work for EA LA, you know, they had Medal of Honor, and they had Command and & Conquer, and a few other games in development. So I got direct exposure to, like, the nuts and bolts of how these games are made and got to meet a lot of the people who involved and understanding the different roles and, and how that stuff is structured. So did you have to go to another studio to get out of QA or were you able to sort of work your foot into the door while you were at EA? Yeah, so when I started at EA, I think it was my first day, they handed out like uh, this handout, you know, and you know, everybody read through this and you know, we'll get you started with the games here shortly. So he came back around and he's like, any questions? And I handed back the thing and I said, I circled every single grammar and spelling error in here. There's a lot. So you might want to fix these. And they were like, and the guy was obviously <laughs> upset. And so he's like, get up. And he pulled me to this other department and he's like, you're working here now. And they were like, you're, you're going to be a compliance lead now. You obviously have an eye for detail. And actually, I didn't know, but that actually turned out to be the best thing that could have happened to me. Before that, EA had really struggled on their like certification through, um, you know, Xbox One and the PS2, and so they were like, "We we really need somebody who's going to be super detail oriented. If you can get, get us through on the first pass, then I think we can probably make you a, a lead." And I was like, "Well, that's a challenge for sure," and I didn't really know how challenging that was going to be. Um, how much experience did you get 
before that would sort of prepare you for a position like that? Or did you just need to jump in and learn all about compliance? Yeah, I knew nothing about that stuff. I sat next to this guy, his name's Adam Bailey. He's just my friend to this day. And, and he taught me everything. And you know, he's such a nice guy that it was just easy to kind of just ask him questions throughout the day. And next thing I knew, I knew, I knew that it's pretty straightforward once you know all the rules and what you need to look for. So when we finally submitted the game the certification, we passed the first time. And like that, mean, uh, that made a big difference around there. For, so next thing you know, I was a lead at the studio, as a uh, QA lead. They had, were just starting up this an internal uh, department called EA Mobile. It was like five guys that, that were making mobile games within that studio at ELA. They asked me if I would like to join them to be a producer. And of course, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, not knowing anything about, about being a producer, or I didn't know anything about mobile games. I just knew, and I, you know, obviously that mobile games at that point were like, you know, it's like a little feature phone. They're not like smartphones. This is before the iPhone or anything that existed. So, like, those experiences were kind of limited, but I knew that it was going to give me some exposure to, um, to development more than I was even doing in QA for console games. Uh, how were those games viewed by the company at that point? I think they didn't really know what to make of them. You know, we were able to, to leverage a bunch of really cool EA licenses to make fairly successful games. And because we were such a small group, the success was actually pretty impressive for such a small group. Um, but then I came to work one day and they go, um, well, our jobs are all gone. <laughs> and I was like, well, what happened? They're like, well, we, we bought Jamdat, which was the biggest um, mobile game developer at the time. And we're going to like merge with them, but like all our all of our jobs are redundant, so you know, you're going to go back to QA. And I was like, I've already worked here for like a year and a half. I've worked my ass off to get to this point. I don't want to take a big step backwards. Actually, I didn't know what to do at the point. So I just kind of got in my car. I drove to Jamdat. I snuck into the building. And I went straight into the CEO's office. <laughs> and I was like, I told him the situation. I was like, you know, I, I, I have a pretty heartfelt kind of listen, I want to make video games. I don't want to go back to doing this. I feel like I've learned so much. I, I think that you guys would benefit from what I've learned so far. And he's like, I just can't, we can't do that right now. He's like, I'll tell you what, go back into QA here. Well, you can be a lead, but doing mobile, mobile phone games. And if you do well in six months, we'll talk. And so I did, which is kind of weird because you're going in as a QA lead into a group of people that I've never met before. So I show up and they're like, who's this guy? And I'm like, I'm the new lead. <laughs> it was so, it was super awkward. But you know, it worked out well. All those guys were super cool. So six months later, I went back into his office and I was like, okay, it's been six months, now what? And he's like, all right, we'll do it. So they made me a producer again. But they made me an assistant producer. It's nice because it gave me a lot of um, ownership over these games, because they're fairly small. You know, big games, it's like, you'll have 20 producers or whatever. This is me and another guy making this game with a developer somewhere. And we were publishing producers at this time. Um, so I got kind of that sense of like, how does a publishing producer differ from a development producer? It was definitely good exposure, for sure. Um, so I, we made all sorts of games. And we made a lot of games, too, because these games, the, the development cycles are just a few months, right? So you're kind of working on three or four games at once. It's kind of fast and furious mode. And it, it definitely got me prepared for my future jobs. Game studios are, especially the independent game studios, you gotta, you gotta get a lot of games out just to keep the lights on. So a lot of the experiences I've learned from working with the, the producers at EA Mobile prepared me for those jobs. Um, we work on a lot of licensed stuff too, so I have exposure to working on um, The Simpsons license and G.I. Joe, and um, so it's, you know, I understood like what it's like to work with a licensor and how that process works and what you can get away with and what you can't. So, I mean, that's something I had no, I had no idea how that world worked. It's really hard to make licensed games. People don't realize that sometimes, maybe. Because there's, you know, they're really protective of their license and they want to make sure that all the decisions you make are, you know, within the canon of the license and, you know, they're, you're, you're not doing stuff with a story that they didn't intend to or whatever. So it's, you know, it's a lot of tap dancing. It's a lot of, like, building relationships with these groups, groups like Gracie Film for, uh, the Simpsons, and, mm -hmm. and they have to feel comfortable that you understand how The Simpsons work. Uh, luckily, I was the, you know, I'm like so obsessed with The Simpsons that they were like, all right, 
you're the guy who talks about The Simpsons all the time, you're probably going to be on that, that project. Mm -hmm. uh, so it worked out pretty well. What led you away from that studio? By the time I, you know, the iPhone launched and that, I, you know, EA Mobile blew up. It, was, it took over like half of EALA, basically, was EA, EA Mobile at this point. Mm -hmm. It went from being like five people to like uh, 200 people, something like that. I just didn't want to, I saw people starting to get typecast as, as like mobile developers or producers. And I, I definitely didn't want to do that. It's exciting, but I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. You know, I wanted to kind of branch out. And I, in my cube, I had the box art for every single LucasArts games printed out and, and put up, you know, like as posters. And my, my good friend, um, Eric Grossman at the time, came by and he said, you should just, just go do it, man. Just go make these games. I know you want to do that. And I was like, maybe I should. And he's like, now's the time. You should do it. And so I, I did. I was like, I'm going to go apply for a Telltale. And the timing couldn't have been more perfect because they were right at the point where they, they needed somebody to come in, you know, who could come and organize things. And they, they're starting to, they're a light, they work on licensed games. I had a lot of experiences working on licensed games. Super enthusiastic about uh, adventure games. So it was a pretty perfect match. So I came in to work on. Uh, the strong bad game um, when there were like one or two episodes in uh, and that was you know it, it was totally a different world you know at that point I was really working on a lot of mobile stuff and I was on the publishing side so this is the first developer that I was like really working on, on as a you know development producer which is totally different than being a publishing producer and so I definitely had to learn on you know really quickly to, to how to do this stuff and, and I was unprepared for some of it but I picked it up on the job so what was the climate at Telltale like? The studio was started with the idea that they were going to do licensed games, which is smart. And I think that they, that they, I mean, a lot of the people who worked there when I was there were all people who had left LucasArts while they were working on the, the new Sam and Max game and the new Full, Full Throttle. Mm -hmm. um, those games were both canceled at LucasArts, and so those teams kind of got together and um, and a portion of them formed Telltale. So a lot, you have a lot of that kind of um, the lineage of these people who would work on um, adventure games all their lives. Some of these, even the scumlets that worked with Tim early on, you know, people like uh, you know Dave Grossman and uh, Mike Stemley and Joe Penny. Um, so you know, a, a lot of the games were kind of traditional point-and-click adventure games. Um, you know, and this is the time when I think. You know, that audience is, it's a pretty finite amount of people. Mm -hmm. Like, they're very passionate. Um, I'm very excited about those games. You know, it's like a quarter million people. <laughs> That's it. And it's, it's really hard to even transcend that audience. And so I think that I was there, um, you know, during the time when they were kind of coming to the realization that maybe going after more mainstream licenses is going to allow them to reach a much wider audience. But while I was there, I was able to work on Monkey Island, the Tales of Monkey Island game. I was the producer on that. And that was, you know, that was a dream come true. That's what I, I would, I mean, that game is amazing. I love the first Monkey Island game. The second one's amazing too. So I was like, man, I can't wait. I can't believe I'm going to work on this. That game, I think the expectations for that were that it was going to be this runaway success. But I don't think it ever met people's expectations um, as far as like the sales. You know, I think it was largely overshadowed by the um, the LucasArts special edition of Monkey Island One because it kind of came out like within the first the same week or two, and so we kind of got lost under that. And I think that sh that shifted a lot of people's opinions about what the future of Telltale was. So there was this gap after Monkey Island finished, where they didn't actually know what they were going to do. They were pursuing licenses, and this is when they were pursuing the license for Jurassic Park and a, a few other ones. Um, so I saw that was, that was coming up soon, and they were like, okay, we have about four or five months, I think, before that game is going to start. So, Matt, why don't you go grab a small team of people and go make a really quick game. This guy, Graham Edible, is excited about making a game. He used to work at LucasArts. He's got this comic called Grickle, and he wants to turn it into a video game. And you know, I watched a few of the Grickle um, videos on YouTube, and read some books, and I was like, holy crap, this is going to be really cool. I'm, I was really, really excited about it. So you know, I spent a few weeks doing, this is the first time I actually got to do art again. Mm -hmm. I did all the tech art for setting up the scenes and like how would that game look? Because it was um, like, how do you realize Graham's 2D art in a 3D world? 
because that was the only way we were going to make this producible to, in order to get it done so quickly. So um, we did a lot of cool experiments, and um, I presented this, this scene that I created to the executives there, and they were like, all right, let's do this. You know, the tech, technical director came in and like did it for real, and like actually found out a way of making a pipeline to, to take what I had created and make it into a full game. And so it was like four or five of us, um, like Jake Rodkin and uh, Sean Vanneman were involved, and Mark Darren. It was a pretty small group. And then Graham was working, you know, he's also working on Coraline because he works at Leica. And at night he's drawing uh, animation frames for, for Puzzle Agent. And it was so much fun. It was such a fun project to work on. Totally off the radar of the executives. And so they, we could do whatever we wanted. And so I, and I think that really helped for us to kind of just kind of take it in weird places and do some really, you know, experimental things. And it, uh, you know, it's one of the games I'm the most proud of working on while I was there, for sure. It's pretty well received, wasn't it? People really liked it. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, we didn't, we had no idea how people were going to take it because it's, you know, it's it's different. It's kind of like a Twin Peaks kind of vibe, um, and I love David Lynch and I love the Twin Peaks, and so I thought it was really cool. Uh, I just I didn't know if anybody else was going to like it, but you know, it did find a find a find a falling for sure. But when I finished that game and we were started transitioning onto Jurassic Park, I knew my days at Telltale were probably over because I I wasn't as interested in working on you know, a big license like at Jurassic Park. I like Jurassic Park, but it just I knew that I wanted to try something a little bit different. And I'd always wanted to work at Double Fine. Um, and I was talking to Graham, and, and I asked him, like, your wife still works at Double Fine, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, can you, can you ask her if there's any jobs over there? And the next thing I know, I was interviewing at Double Fine. And I got the job. <laughs> So like when you went to Telltale, did you think that Double Fine would be like a possibility down the road? Like, why didn't you apply there sooner? So when I first got to Double Fine um, as a producer, um, it, it, they gave me access to like the applicant database, you know, and it shows like every person who's ever applied to Double Fine since the beginning of Double Fine, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. So the first thing I did was I typed my own name in there, <laughs> and I came up on the list. And I was like, oh my god, they have like. I can see what everybody said about me when I applied here like five years ago or whatever. And so I saw it, and I saw from Melina it said, not qualified, not enough experience. And she's right, at that time I was definitely not experienced enough, you know. I had always wanted to work here. And you know, when I applied and I got rejected, I was like, I didn't know how I was going to get here, but I figured that maybe there was an inroad through Telltale. What were they working on at the time? Was Brutal Legend out at that point? Brutal Legend had just shipped. The reason why they hired me at Double Fine is because um, both Iron Brigade and Once Upon a Monster were kind of having some difficulties um, with their production. I guess it's just getting an organization around, like, we need somebody to help, like, figure out how we're going to finish this game. Like, when I sat down and played Iron Brigade, I was like, this game is has a lot of, I could tell it has a lot of potential, but it was still trying to find its voice in a lot of ways. Like, it was trying to do a lot of things, and it needed some focus. And that focus didn't come from me. It came from the team, but it, that, that was such a collaborative project. You know, Brad was obviously the project lead, but you know, we all had lots of ideas on how to make this thing better. What I was able to do was to come in and, and put a lot of organization around the project, and sit down with Brad and kind of narrow down like what really matters, you know, like let's distill this idea down to like the essence. And Brad knew the answers, you know, it's just having somebody to talk through this with, you know, they always say like Matt's the adult who can count on the team. So the person is going to go in there and like figure out all the math of like what would it take to do the thing you guys are talking about? Is that even possible within the time we have? These projects have budgets, it's not, it doesn't go on forever. And we knew at a certain point that Microsoft was going to say, like, all right, you got to ship what you got. So we wanted to make sure that when we hit that point, we had a game that we were excited about releasing. And so and it, it, the game turned, turned around pretty quickly. I think I was, I, I can't believe how the team came together around that game. And I, it was cool to be a part of that, because I think that they just needed that step of um, adding organization. In my opinion, that's what producers should do. It's about like, facilitating the creativity of the team and you know, helping them realize it, you know, it's you're not like the doer. You're the person that like that helps it all happen, like by 
by keeping it like very predictable and very like laid out. And so everybody knows exactly what do we need to do to get to that goal. It's kind of the unsung hero of some of the games, right? It's the boring part a lot of the times. It's a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of Gantt charts and that kind of stuff that's pretty boring. But like it is what makes games good in a lot of ways because at some point, if you're kind of just all over the place, you'll never get that focus. You need someone to understand like, when do we focus on what? And when can we stop working on features? When do we start working on polish? All these sort of things. How do you look at it and decide what's important? Yeah. Focus people in on those things. Yeah, actually for Iron Brigade, what I did when I first came in was I met with every single person at the, on the team. Brad and I did. We sat down with them on my computer and we wrote down every single thing that we could think of that a person needs to do to finish the game. Whether it's stuff that we want to do or not, just things that were discussed. We just get it all on their paper. And then we just, we just started making like, you know, on the spot cuts or, you know, estimates until we got to the point where we're like, all right, I think we've identified all the, at least the high level beats of like, what does everybody need to do to hit, you know, Brad's vision for this game? And I think just getting, once you have all this stuff in front of you and laid out, it lets you really kind of see it all holistically and, and understand like, wait, we can even narrow this down even further. We kind of went about it that way. I mean, we, we always leave a little bit of flex in there for like, someone comes in, they had some awesome idea the night before, you know, it's, we want to make sure that those ideas can still get in too. But, um, there still has to be a little bit of structure around it, so at least we have, you know, a good chance of finishing the game on time. So it, it, I mean, it seemed like a big part of your life's direction was, in a way, influenced by like, you know, you wanted to work on these type of games with Tim Schafer, like that was like your your main goal. Mm -hmm. So like when you got here and you actually fulfilled that in some way, like how did that change the way you felt about everything? It's surreal. I think, to, you know. It's a surreal situation to work on Broken Age with Tim. You know, he wants to just ha have a limitless um, amount of ability to just edit and add and add and add and you know every cool idea we want to get in there. And it's like I knew it was going to be a challenge, right? Because you want to you don't want to stop Tim from realizing his vision. And every idea that he comes up with, I absolutely agree that it would just going to make the game better. You know, and it's it's tough sometimes because you got to be like that might not fit in the schedule. And, you know, those are the conversations that are, that are difficult sometimes. You know, it's kind of hard to tell your, your hero that they can't have that thing that they want, you know. And it's, and I mean, it's never really that cut and, you know, cut and dry. And it's always a conversation. But Tim knows, too. He understands the situation. He, and he wants to find a compromise that works for everybody. Having to go into Tim's office and tell him that he can't do this thing he wants to do, just to be in that position, it's extremely strange. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think... For Broken Age, um, I wasn't the producer on that game for a really long time. I was working with with Ron Gilbert on the Cave, um, and I, you know, I was I was trying to give advice to to Greg as they're going in, but it's so hard because you you know, it's hard to even how do you say no to an idea when you don't even know if it's within the scope of the schedule. It's kind of hard when you're early on. It's easy when you're towards the end because you're like, I mean, we only have a few weeks left to finish this thing. Obviously, we can't add new stuff, but like. It's difficult to gauge the scope of something when you don't know how long all these things are going to take to come together. It's not like ordering carpet, you know. It's like X amount of square feet, you know. We know when we're done. I know how much it'll cost. Like, it's not that easy. And it's not like making the next version of Call of Duty where it's like you're gonna. It's going to be the same game with new missions and graphics. Or even then, it's, a lot of that stuff is reused. We have a lot of metrics now that we can use to like quantify a lot of our decisions, but. For the longest time, we didn't because we hadn't built a uh, adventure game here with a new engine, with a group who had never made that before, using 2D animation that no one has ever done here before. Just like a ton of unknowns. And so we don't have any historical data we can pull from to go like, oh, that's clearly going to take this long. We can't do that. So that was definitely one of those challenges going into it. But, you know, Tim responds well to data. You know, it's the more we can show him, like, you know, this is how long that took last time, this is how long it take this time, maybe we can find a way of making it shorter or whatever. He totally understands. But, you know, you kind of have to do it once in order to get that historical data to actually kind of make those arguments. When uh, Issa had to leave, you got promoted up into her position. It seems like it's a role that's less directly involved in development, in a way. So, I'm just curious how you felt about taking a step in that direction. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was like a battlefield promotion kind of thing. 
You know, I was the executive producer f at the studio for like a year and a half before that. And so this kind of, it kind of came out of nowhere. I was actually caught off guard and I would, didn't, didn't expect it to happen at all. Issa's is awesome and she offered a lot to the studio. Actually, I really looked up to her and I, I learned a lot from her as well. And I th felt like there was still a lot more that I could learn from her. But when she announced she was leaving for personal reasons, which I totally understand, and, and my heart goes out to her, you know, and, I, and luckily things have gotten a lot better for her since then. Um, yeah, it's tough. I don't. I, I knew that the studio needed it, and I knew that there. There was um, there wasn't anybody else who was who was going to be able to do that at the studio. Yeah, you're right. It's it's a lot le it's a lot less um, focus on development. It's a lot more on the business. Um, but I have experience doing that before, and so I was able to pull from those experiences. It's caused me to grow quite a bit. It's caused me to do a lot of stuff that I'm just, it's outside of my comfort zone. Um, but I'm learning more on, every day, and I'm still also a producer, you know, I'm still the producer on Grim Fandango and Day of the Tentacle, uh, closing out Broken Age with Greg. So I still get exposure to that stuff, just, I I'll have to do the other stuff as well. It wasn't terribly long after that that like the studio had the uh, the product uh, project cancellation, and it was the first like round of layoffs that Double Fine has ever had to do. Mm -hmm. Really, sitting down with Tim and talking about that, seeing the pain on his face as we're talking through a list of people, right, and trying to like make smart business decisions. You know, it's. They're people, right? This is definitely, this studio for sure is a family. Like, um, it's built off loyalty. It's built off respect. And there is a reason why there's so many people here who worked on Psychonauts, right? The people who have been here for like 12 years. It's so uncommon in this industry. It's because um, it's an awesome place to work. You know, and it's like, these people are family, and how do you even talk about that sort of thing? But. The reality was, it was either we have that discussion or we shut down the studio completely. And obviously we can't do that. It was uh, seriously a situation that I was hoping to avoid and waiting for like the last minute miracle to come in that we didn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. But when the, tame, the time came, I'm, it was the hardest thing I've had to do, for sure. Just looking around these people's faces, people who are my friends, people who I've spent you know, late nights with making video games, and, and now they're not going to work here anymore. It's it's tough for sure. Did you do anything to prepare yourself for that experience, or did you just have to kind of go with it as it was happening? I drank some alcohol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Took a few shots of uh, vodka before I came to work. It did not help. <laughs> I think it almost made it worse. No, there's nothing I, I could do to prepare myself. I couldn't even talk to anybody about it because it was, yeah. you know, it's a secret between Tim and, and me. And yeah, it it sucks. It's, I've never seen Tim so upset in my life. You know, like he, um, he doesn't really sh wear his heart on his sleeve, but in that moment I saw it. You know, I saw, I saw how much he cared and that, that was, did you ever expect to have to deal with all this stuff or that this industry would be like this? Um, I mean, you previously practically lost your job at places before, but just as you move up in terms of like management and having to deal with the business aspect of things more, just like the tough decisions. Yeah. Like, was that something you ever thought about in the past that you'd have to deal with? I mean, I, I, it comes with the job, I guess. I didn't suspect I would ever have to do that here just because We've gone so long without having to do anything like that. The studio has had so many like ups and downs, and and I was I was privy to some of those things, and so I I, I knew how it was. But it, it always seemed like it always worked out. Someone always swooped in and saved the day. When we actually had to go into the room and do it, it's like, when's this, when's someone when's someone going to stop this? You know, when's going to show up with a, enough money to save all these people's jobs? And then it just didn't happen. Has it changed your feelings about the studio or the industry, having to struggle all the time like this? You know, it's it's difficult because in that case specifically, it was about a project getting canceled. You know, and I um, 
you know, I went up to go meet with the, pu the partner that was the publisher and to talk about the game and how they were feeling about it. And, um, re you know, the executive producer reassured me, like, we are super excited about this game. Like, everybody's talking about how excited they are. And so, yeah, this is one of the, our big titles. Can't wait for it to come out. You have nothing to fear. It's going to be great. And don't worry. If anything ever happens, I will definitely let you know in person. I'll show up, and you'll know way ahead of time. And so I was like, all right, well, that sounds great. And then when it happened, it was like, you know, called me on the phone, and it happened right there. And I was like, what happened? <laughs> Wait, what happened to before? What happened before when you said you, a few weeks ago when you told me you were going to tell me to my face and that I would know way ahead of time and that the game was doing great? You know, it just, it's one of those things where you get a glimpse into, like, the internal politics of these publishers where, you know, their opinions about things, are, they change from day to day, and people come in, like, new executives come in, and they, they want to, like, start their own kind of legacy, and they want to get rid of whoever, whatever the legacy of the last person was, so they cancel projects and start new ones, and so we got caught up in that. It's unfortunate, because people don't know how that works sometimes, and it's people's lives are involved. You know, we can't, some people can totally absorb something like that, and just and move on and you know, shuffle everybody to another team, whatever. We can't do that. You know, Double Fine, we make awesome games that don't sell like a, a gajillion copies. And like, we're not Call of Duty, we're not, you know, we're not Try, try On, or we're not uh, Treyarch, we're not um, Infinity War, we're not EA. We, just, we can't absorb a, f a cancellation of a project like that. And so it's sad because I feel like we're trying to do something different here. We're trying to like um, make take some some risks with the games that we make, and um, yeah, that doesn't that doesn't always pay off for us, unfortunately. It's the sad truth of this real of this industry is that cool creative games don't make all the money. You know, the ones that make the money are the ones that are the ones that um, that kind of play by the formula, and the ones that are like mass market licenses and zombies and um, where you have like business people making decisions about how to like adjust freemium stuff or you know free to play stuff so you can extract as much money from the player as possible. So you have psychologists and all these people involved in games that I never even knew would ever be involved in games. It's becoming more of a science than it is about like a creative um, venture, and that's it's disappointing for me. But you know there's still a lot of awesome studios that that aren't doing that, and so. A glimmer of hope is out there that, you know, that's still, there's still a way of making a business work with making cool games and not worrying about that other stuff. It, it seems like a real, like, emotional roller coaster. Does it help, like, at least as, like, a motivator that you get to, like, work on all these classic titles? Yeah, I can. It's still surreal that I get to work on any of these titles. Mm -hmm. Like, working on Grim Fandango is insane. I can't believe that's having the opportunity to, to work on a game as a fan and as a developer is pretty cool. And I feel like we bring that, you know, like I think that comes out in the game. You see that it's good when you read things about people saying like, this was a very respectful remaster. You know, like someone obviously cared. Someone actually really knew a lot about this game to make it, you know. And then you have Tim there too. You know, that's pretty cool. Because he's got ideas how he wants to do it too. And, and, he, and, he, and he's excited about how excited we were, are about his old games. And so it's it's really cool to to even be able to brainstorm with him about how do we make this game awesome for like a new audience. I mean, since you're on the eve of putting out an adventure game with Tim, I mean, do you feel like you did right by what your brother had told you? I mean, how do you feel like, you know, what, what, what would you think, I guess, of all this? Yeah, I don't, I feel like the reason why this all happened is because my brother's been with me the whole time, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I think he would be really proud of me. It's awesome because now I get to work on uh, Day of the Tentacle with Tim and uh, Dave Grossman. And, and you know, Dave Grossman sat next to me for two and a half years at Telltale. Like we shared cube walls. And it's like having Yoda sit next to you, basically. Like having Yoda in the cube next to you. You know, and he, you know, he doesn't mean to, but you know, he's listening to my conversations and stuff. And then you hear like a little Yoda quote come from him. And I'm like, That's pretty smart, pretty smart guy. So I, I, you know, I love Dave Grossman, and so getting to work with him again is uh, is awesome. And seeing the like chemistry between him and Tim again is awesome. I think that's the stuff that would make my brother the most proud is to see, you know, how we're we're able to 
to bring this game and, and give it to new audiences. And I hope that some, somebody and their brother are going to be able to play it together and have the same experience as I had with my brother. It's pretty rare that anyone can sort of uh, stand at like this, the cusp of making a bunch of decisions and be like, well, here's this aiming for the stands type of thing I'm going to do. Yeah. And then you manage to actually do that. It's, I still feel like, you know, at any moment someone's going to figure me out as a phony. <laughs> But I know deep down that, you know, it's from my perseverance. Yeah. The, the phony thing is a funny thing that always comes up because a lot of people say that. Like, a lot of like people. Really yeah. I mean, Peter Molyneux said that, and I, when he said that, you know, when when I heard Peter Molyneux questioning his own abilities, I was like, "But you're one of my favorite game designers. Like, why did you ever think that?" And then for a second, I was like. I guess a lot of people feel that way. Like a lot of people question whether they're good enough. You know, maybe that makes you try harder. Maybe it made me try harder. I feel like you got to fake it before you make it. I mean, Tim said that, right? I think it's probably true. I'm still growing into this position. I'm still learning things every day. Um, it's definitely, uh, it's it's a challenge. It's it's definitely stuff that I've never done before and things I never thought I would do. Every day goes by and the company's still open and the games are still getting made. And, it's pretty incredible, though. This studio, specifically, puts out more games than any other game studio of its size. As far, as far as, I mean, I could be wrong, but it certainly feels that way. It feels like we put a lot of games out, and it's just like this fast and furious. And that's super exciting. I love, I love always working on new stuff. And every game we create is different, right? We don't, we don't only create adventure games. We're creating, you know, we created a shooter. We created a children's game. We created... Uh, stacking doll game <laughs> and like getting to work on those different games is, is amazing and it just goes to show like you know this the team we have at Double Fine these people are so insanely talented like they could go work anywhere and make a lot more money probably but they don't do that because they want to work on stuff that's creative and challenging and inspiring and like that's really cool I, it inspires me to see these people that are so talented. I learned all the all the time just by talking to these guys, just being blown away by like, holy crap, you guys know so much about how to you know execute on these ideas. It's, it's just really just really amazing. So yeah, it's exciting. I, I can't wait to to see what we're gonna do next.